Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Howarth, and it's of course a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship for this all too short debate about the place I think we affectionately refer to as the other place. But another worldly place I think it would be quite hard to imagine or conceive. The House of Lords must now be about the most bizarre, absurd, ridiculous political institution that we have anywhere in the world. Bloated, ermine coated, never been voted, it is now an affront to every sense and notion of democracy. There are now some 847 souls who inhabit this place just now. That makes it the second largest political legisl legislature anywhere in the world, save the People's Congress of China. Now, like the Chinese Politburo, it's similarly a stranger to democracy. But unlike the People's Congress, it can't even claim a constituency and can't claim to represent anybody whatsoever at all. Now, who are these curious, strange people who inhabit this gold-plated, red-upholstered Narnia? Well, the vast majority of them are appointed. Some of them are appointed by an independent appointments authority. But the vast majority are appointed by the Prime Minister, from lists drawn up by the three establishment Westminster parties. No other legislature in the world is composed quite like this, other than Lesotho in Southern Africa. Now, they're not all appointed. We have what's called the baronets. There's 86 of them, Mr. Howarth. Baronets, people who have a role in our democracy because of birthright. People who can scrutinise, initiate and consider our legislation because they are the first son of a family that won a decisive battle in the Middle Ages. This isn't an episode out of the Game of Thrones. This is the fifth largest economy in the Western world. And we can't... Of course I would. A lot of what he's had to say. Does he feel that it's any less desirable to be the first-born son of someone who's had a hereditary period for six or seven generations than it is to be a large-scale donor to a political party, which is how most of the people, it seems to me, have... Uh, earned their places in this particular house or being uh, superannuated council leaders over the last 15 years. Well, I'm very grateful should. to the Honourable Gentleman because I have a, a very few choice words to say about the appointees to the House of Chamber. So if he bears with me, I will come to those very points. So we've got the hereditaries. But to make the place even more bizarre and surreal, there's 26 places reserved for bishops. But not just any ordinary bishops, they have to be Church of England bishops. Again, the House of Lords is the only legislature in the world that has places reserved for clerics other than the Islamic State of Iran. And we can't get rid of these people. We can't get rid of them. They can, they, they, they're now allowed to retire. They're not accountable to any constituency. They're not accountable to any electorate. The only people that seem to get rid of them aren't the public of, the great, of great Britain. It's the Grim Reaper. And one of the few House of Lords reforms I've had in the course of this par Parliament is the ability to allow these people to retire. Only one has come forward. So what do we do? We make inducements to try and get them to retire. They can now use the facilities of the House of Lords if they choose to retire. They still won't come forward. Mr Howarth, this is a ridiculous and absurd institution. The average age of the House of Lords is now 70 years old. And how much does this political circus cost? Well, last year it was almost £100 million. And their friends in the House of Lords don't come, come cheap. Of course they shouldn't come cheap. They could claim £300 per day for just turning up to work. Now, if that's too much trouble for them, they could claim £150 per day for working from home. Your average if we could call them such a thing as average, work, House of Lords, your average peer, now costs a cool £28,000. Now, some of them do work hard, and we know lots of examples of some really hard-working peers who turn up diligently day after day to put in the work and do that shift. But too many of them, all too many of them, do practically nothing for this money that they're given by the taxpayer. Now, I don't want to pick on my Scottish... Um, peer colleagues, but I had a cursory glance at the activity list of some of my Scottish peers who 
and notionally, I believe, look after Scottish interests in the House of Lords. And where again some of them are diligent, hard-working individuals, all too many of them do practically nothing for this taxpayer largesse. There is, for example... Of course, give me to the I think it, it is important in this debate uh, that we look perhaps beyond just the issue of the composition of the House of Lords. Um, he refers to the idea of Scottish interests being looked after by Scottish peers. That's not their purpose. They do not have a constituency interest. They are here to uh, scrutinise uh, legislation. Perhaps he could go into a little bit of detail about some of the very worthy work that is done by a significant number of uh, peers, perhaps not all 800 or so, but certainly several <laughs> hundred of them who do uh, play that important role, uh, even though they obviously have no representative uh, interest. I, sure. Again, I'm very grateful to them, and I just beg patience once again, because I'm just trying to paint a little bit of a background exactly to the activities of the House of Lords and the type and the nature of the chamber that we're dealing with. I do want to come on to this, but I think it's important that the taxpayers of this country get to understand the type of service that they get for this £100 million that is paid on an annual basis to sustain these people. Some of them who work very hard, as the Honourable Gentleman says, but some of, them, some of them who do next to nothing at all. And I think it's right and proper that we look at these people because we can't get rid of them. We can't do anything about it. They're not accountable to any constituency. So it's right that they're scrutinised, just like the Honourable Gentleman is a parliamentarian, just like I am as a parliamentarian. I think it's right that we look at the activities of our colleagues and friends in the House of Lords just to assess and just to see if we do get that value for money. Which brings me back once again, Mr Howarth, to my colleagues, the Scottish peers. Now, they don't represent any constituency, but what I do, I turn up to these meetings, and I see a Scottish colleague here, and we see the Scottish lords in attendance, and they're always at these type of events, and again and again we're told that our interests are looked after in the House of Lords on that basis. But what we find is Baroness Adams of Craigie Lee, who's claimed that eye-watering £50,000, but has spoken in only two debates and has never asked a written question since entering the Lords in 2005. There's Lord Kirkhill, who costs us £49,239, spoken in no debates, and again has asked absolutely no written questions. Further down the list, there's our noble friend, the Lord Elder, again £50,000, and again spoken two debates and asked no questions. He did, though, as a good public servant, serve on the Refreshments Committee between the years 2008 and 2013. Which brings me on to the very good and impeccable cultured tastes of our Lordships. Because what we found in the course of the last four years, they've got through some 17,000 bottles of fine champagne costing more than £260,000. For the Honourable Gentleman to the advice in Erskine May on uh, re references to members of the House of Lords and it says it is considered undesirable that any member of the House of Lords should be mentioned by name or otherwise identified for the purpose of a criticism of a personal nature. It is of course in order for the Honourable Gentleman to talk about what they do, how they're appointed and so on uh, but I think he is now straying into territory that is probably inadvisable. Uh, well, I'm grateful, Mr Howe, and I promise not to do it again. But on to our champagne, if I may, Mr Howe. Because, seemingly, the House of Lords rejected the vulgar variety that served in the House of Commons. This, and I quote, because the Lords feared that the quality of champagne we'd be not as good as if they had a joint service with the House of Commons. This was reported in one of our many joint committees, and we had the astonished chair, the right honourable member, the member for Blackburn, who turned to the clerk and said, did you make that up? The clerk assured him he did not. <laughs> yes, of course. I just wonder whether he could clarify that, in fact, of course, the champagne that they drink in the House of Lords is not free. <laughs> they do pay for it. Well, I never made any claim that it was, but I'm glad he clarified that and set that up. The, ho the House of Commons champagne is not free, but by God, it seems like our friends in the House of Lords certainly like to quaff a good bottle of it in the course of a year. But it would be wrong of me, Mr Howarth, and remiss of me to try and suggest and claim that the House of Lords was totally undemocratic, because that just wouldn't be the case, and I would not like to mislead the House in that respect. They do, of course, have elections, you have by-elections. It's when the earls, the dukes, the ladies, the lords, the baronets and the barons, the hereditary peers of the realm 
get together in one of their now regular by-elections to decide which amongst their numbers should continue to rule over us. It must be the most weirdest constituency in the world, the most privileged and aristocratic electorate that you're ever likely to find anywhere. Uh, <laughs> thank the member for giving way and congratulate him on securing the debate and uh, acknowledge him waxing lyrical on his, uh, on his diatribe against the, the House of Lords, much of which will be shared, I'm sure, across the nation. But does he agree with me, and perhaps he is coming on in his speech, uh, on the need for a more democratised revising chamber at all, or is he going to dismiss it entirely? No, I, I mean, I'm grateful to the Honourable sure. I actually believe, I'm not a unicameralist, believe it or not, and I'll say to the Honourable Gentleman and to you, Mr Howarth, I actually believe that a nation as complex and as large as the United Kingdom needs a functioning supervisory chamber. And I'm going to come on, and I hope the Honourable Gentleman bears with me, because I want to come on to suggest the type of way that we could make progress with this. This debate is House of Lords reform, and that's what I promise the gentleman. But what I think is unacceptable, in which the British people should no longer put up with any longer, is that circus down there, with the ridiculous spectacle of lords, ladies, deference, forelock tugging, the rest of it. We need a properly equipped legislature designed for the 21st century, not one designed for the medieval ages or something out of the 14th century. So I do want to come on to that, and I'll come on to the very clear principles that I want to actually try and establish. I'll give way to the gentleman for the last time, because I've been very generous with him, and you I know I want to see his speech. He refers to the anachronistic election procedure for hereditary peers, but does he not recognise that that whole mechanism was put into place uh, to ensure that the piecemeal reforms that took place in 1999 was not the end of the matter? Uh, the sort of reforms that both, I think both he and I would very much support, um, perhaps more wholesale, but they do require the idea of still having this anachronistic hereditary element. Let's get rid of the entirety uh, of, of what we have at, at the moment, sweep the whole thing away. But without that anachronism, uh, there would probably be a, a reluctance to do the sort of radical reform that he and I would support. Well, it was a result of the 1999 Act, as the gentleman, or honourable gentleman obviously knows, that the vast majority of the hereditaries were removed. We're still left with 86, and this has always been considered unfinished business, but it's been a long time coming. They're still there. There's still people due to birthright who are actually having a role in our democracy. And to me, that is unacceptable. We are all Democrats in this house. We cannot allow people who are only there because of their family and the first son of that family to have a role in our democracy. Now, Mr Howarth, we might laugh, and it's, I suppose it's easy to put fun at an institution that is just so singularly absurd and bizarre. But there is a very sinister role to the activities of the House of Commons. And why it is sinister and why it is open to abuse <coughs> is it's because it's an appointed chamber. We don't leave and don't bother with this whole exercise of letting the public decide and construct this chamber down the road. We leave it up to politicians. Now, the temptation for these politicians is to stuff it full of their friends, their cronies, and their placement. We need an elderly member of parliament to move on for a dynamic, thrusting new young member. Give him a place in the House of Lords. That dynamic, thrusting young member, and I'm looking at the, the honourable gentleman, and he didn't take a place. He, he, we might just lose his seat. Let's cushion the blow. Let's let him continue with his political career. Give him a place in the House of Lords. And all too commonly, we're finding that that is how the House of Lords is being used and abused. A place for cronies, a place for placemen, and a place for time servers. And it's not good enough. But that isn't the thing that particularly bothers me. The thing that concerns me most, and the thing, the thing that should concern everybody in this House, are the donors. The people who have a place in our democracy in the second chamber of this house, whose only qualification seems to be to be able to give substantial and significant sums to one of the three main establishment Westminster parties. 
These are the people that trouble me, Mr. Howarth, and these are the people who should, who should trouble the rest of the United Kingdom. Because what we find are lots and lots of people appointed by the political parties who seem to have no other ability other than to be able to come up and manufacture large sums of cash to sustain these political parties, and it is not good enough. Now, my honourable friend, the member for Inyaligan and Yar, who I was hoping would be with us this morning, tested this to its absolute legal limit in the last parliament. He looked at this, he saw a connection to the highest level of the then Labour government, and he said, there's something wrong here, and he asked the Metropolitan Police to investigate. What we then had, Mr Howarth, was one of the most dramatic political police operations of recent years, the Cash for Honours investigation. What we had was the sight of a sitting Prime Minister, Tony Blair, being questioned by police, the arrest of his chief fundraiser and other members of his staff. Now, charges were dropped. There was no charges brought. It wasn't because there wasn't a case to answer. It wasn't because there was a clean bill of health presented to this whole process. There was no evidence found. And the C Criminal Prosecution Service felt that they could not proceed with this case. Now, we could all make up our minds about the type of influence that was going to be exerted on the CPS and on the Metropolitan Police to drop such a dynamic case, but it was never given a clean bill of health, and there's still outstanding issues when it comes to donations to parties. Because you only have to look at the list. Look at the list from last year. The people that were given appointments to the House of Lords. A total con con contribution of £7 million from those recently ennobled were given to the three establishment Westminster parties. Now, you would have thought after Cash for Honours, something as dramatic as that police investigation, that that place would be beyond reproach, that they would have cleaned up their act and there would be no suggestion or even whiff of any type of abuse or wrongdoing. Not a bit of it, Mr Howarth. It would seem that you can't change those ermine spots. So what we've had since then, we've had peers banged up in jail for abuse expenses. We've had cash for influence and we've had cash for amendments. We've even, Mr Howarth, had son of cash for, on for honours. Because what we found is the three biggest donors to the Liberal Party, and there's no Liberals here, so I'm, I'm sorry if I'm picking on them, Mr Howarth, but I didn't want to pick on the Liberals. But, oh, there is, sorry, the Honourable Gentleman is there. So I'll say to the Honourable Gentleman, maybe this is something he, could want, he might want to pick up. What we find is that th the three biggest donors to the Liberals, people who just so happened to provide two-fifths of the party's donations, were given peerages by the Deputy Prime Minister. This for forced the departing peer, Lord Oakshot, to concede that cash for honours was still very much alive and that, and I quote from his own words, my efforts to expose and end cash for peerages in all parties, including our own, and help get the Lords elected, have failed. Mr Howarth, the House of Lords, because of its nature, because it is an appointed body, because it doesn't bother to go through the whole process of elections and be accountable to a constituency, is therefore rife for this type of abuse and this type of activity. Now, I think the British public deserve better than this. I think that they deserve a scrutinising chamber that is beyond reproach that is democratically decided and that they can get rid of if they're unhappy with their activities. Our political institutions have never been held in such contempt by the British public. We see that day in, day out. The trust and confidence in the Westminster establishment and the Westminster elite that run this place has never been held in such low esteem by the British public. Now, I suggest to you, Mr Howarth, that when the public observe an undemocratic, ermine-ridden house like they have down the road, this just compounds that very strong sense of alienation from the whole process of government. Of course, I'll give way to the Honourable Gentleman. I'm grateful to Honourable Gentleman for giving way, and can I say to him of the House that uh, I'm going to a committee shortly, so I'll not be able to hear the uh, end of the debate, but can I say to the Honourable Gentleman, I agree with everything that he has said. Would he agree with me that... 
any revising chamber which maintains should be elected 100%. Uh, and one of the uh, advantages of doing that particular, well, and one thing that also should be done, it should be elected by proportional representation, so that a revising chamber would also be a powerful check and balance on an over-mighty government elected, uh, as it is in the present system, uh, by the first past the post system, which is undemocratic. Well, we shall... I'm grateful to the Honourable Gentleman, and I, I know the Honourable Gentleman's record in dealing with these issues, and I know that he's been a big advocate of House of Lords reform, and I congratulate him for the efforts he's made, and I do agree with him. I disagree with the Labour Party's position on all this, and I debated this last night and in advance of this debate on, on television, Mr Howarth, and the Labour Party's position to me, and maybe I don't know if the Honourable Gentleman buys into this, is a, a sort of secondary mandate that he wants, and we might hear it from the from the, the, the Shadow Minister today, where it seems to be that the institutions of the United Kingdom somehow decide amongst themselves about who should inhabit this place. And I'm interested to hear more about this. The, the Honourable Gentleman's shaking his head, so we'll hear from him about exactly what the Labour Party's plan was. But I think that was suggested in the House of Lords. And I, was, I watched the debate yesterday, but I'm sure that the Honourable Gentleman has his plan. But yes, it should be, this Honourable Gentleman says. I don't think there's any substitute for democracy. Of course there's not any substitute for democracy. We live, we live in a, a democratic country, culture and society. Of course these places have to be elected. So, Mr Howarth, it has to change. It has to change. This cannot go on. We've tried to reform this place. We've tried to democratise the place. Every single effort has failed over the last 20 years. It's now time to concede... And it might be hard for the 850-odd members, looking to be a 1,000 soon in the next parliament probably, I think we just have to concede the whole place is unreformable. It's time to rip the whole thing up and start, start again. And I think that's the only way that, that we could do this. Now, I, as I've said, believe that we do need a, a second chamber. We are a complex, large democracy. We have asymmetrical devolution in all parts of the United Kingdom. And I'm open to any suggestions and plans about how we might be able to progress this and be able to take this forward. But I don't think it's for me, a noiky gnat backbencher, to suggest to the great and the good of the great Westminster establishment parties about what sort of model it should be adopted. I don't think that's my job, Mr Howard. I'll leave it to the, the great minds and the front benches that we see assembled here today to try and determine our, our way through. So what I'm going to do is suggest several principles that I believe has to underpin a brand new institution as we go forward. The first of these, and this is as the Honourable Gentleman says, it has to be exclusively democratic. We can no longer go forward with an institution that is appointed, and certainly an institution that has people there because of their family. That cannot go on. It has to be democratic principles. And I'll tell you something which is embarrassing about this. I'm a governor of the Westminster Foundation for Democracy, Mr Howarth, a, a, a task that I take very seriously, and I believe there's a fantastic amount of work in this world. I go around the world speaking to emerging democracies Speaking and encouraging good governance, trying to support as much as I possibly can multi-party democracy. How can we give that message with the embarrassment of that undemocratic institution down the road? How dare we go forward and try to suggest to these developing nations, these countries that are struggling with their democratic principles, that they somehow emulate the United Kingdom. What, ask them to get lords, ask them to jump around like Santa Claus with the red cloaks on. It's something that we embarrasses this nation and it's an embarrassment particularly to me and I'm sure to anybody else who does this work around the world on behalf of this country. So the first principle, absolutely, exclusively democratic and I think that that should go without saying. Secondly, it has to be in proportion to the main chamber. It is preposterous that we have a chamber of this size. 847 members, soon to probably be 1,000. It has to be been proportioned to the main chamber, and I would suggest a quarter of the size, a quarter to a third. Anything between 200 and 250 members should, should be sufficient for the task that is required. So it brings me to my third principle, and I think one that's also very important. The role of this new chamber this new assembly should be clearly defined. My view is that it should be 
exclusively scrutiny, exclusively supervisory. I am unhappy when I see bills initiated in an undemocratic house. And we've considered quite a few bills in the course of the last parliamentary session that were initiated in the House of Lords. I'm not happy about that. I don't think it's right. I think it's elected members that should initiate legislation and elected members who should design and shape that. Now, please, yes, scrutinise, have a look at it, tell us where we have it wrong, improve it if necessary, but it should be supervisory and that should be it. And one of the reasons that House of Lords reform failed in the last couple of years was the spurious fears by Conservative members who sort of suggested that any elected chamber would be a challenge to the supremacy of the main elected house, as if that would be a bad thing, as if a little bit of a challenge would actually help elected members in the House of Commons. Now, myself and the honourable gentleman sitting just behind me are Scottish members of Parliament. We have MSPs that we share constituencies with. We even have list MSPs that we share constituencies with. What it does for me, and I'm sure it is the same for a hard-working um, honourable gentleman like the, the member for Leith and Edinburgh North, is that it spurs us on to make sure we do better. So this nonsense about having a, some sort of, you know, like competition to the main house, spurious claim. But if we clearly define the roles and functions of the distinct and separate houses, then that lays to bed that particular issue. I'll give way to the honourable gentleman. Uh, I thank the honourable member for giving way and commend him uh, on securing the debate. The issue that he has raised where many members of the House of Commons, when it comes to Lord's reform, profess themselves very precious about the democratic integrity and authority uh, of the House of Commons, they don't seem to be as precious about that when it comes to constantly allowing not just bills be initiated in the Lords, but allowing the key amendments be passed in the Lords, even when there's a will for them in the House of Commons. The House of Commons consistently defers to the House of Lords to produce the amendments. Now, I, I, I'm very grateful to the Honourable Chairman because he's absolutely right. And what we're finding now is this increasing use of the House of Lords as a chamber that puts through government amendments. And he and I sat through the counter-terrible five days we had of that. As the Honourable Gentleman, the Member for Westminster, we all sat through that bill I thought I, was, I thought I was elected by the people of Perth and North Perthshire to determine legislation, to look at this, to scrutinise it, to try and improve it. Then we were told that it's going to be done in the House of Lords and it'll come back to us amended. Now, the use of the House of Lords for government amendments is an inappropriate use of that House and that's something that has to end. And if we get these two different and distinct chambers properly aligned, properly distinct, then these type of issues would end. So I'll come to my last principle, and it's, I think I mentioned it to the honourable gentleman at the back, get shot of the deference, get shot of the 13th century institutions, something like Game of Thrones, for goodness sake. This is the 21st century. We need an institution, we need our democracy to reflect the age that we live in, this forelock tugging, this curtsying, this lords, ladies, barons, dukes, earls, nonsense. Get rid of it. It is absolutely absurd and ridiculous. Let's get a modern function, democratic chamber that looks and feels like the community and society we serve. And if we get that, we'll be making real, real progress. So these, Mr. Howarth, are my principles about how we should establish a new and democratic chamber to look after the legislation of their house. As I said, it's not up to an oiky backbench MP like me to try and suggest the particular models, though I have to say that I am attracted to the honourable gentleman's point, which is using the Europarliamentary constituencies as a means to have a proportional representation election to get these 200, 250 members that we require. So maybe that's something we'd look. And I'll finish because I've been on my feet for half an hour, Mr. Mr. Um, Howarth, because we're coming up to an election. And like every time we come up to an election, <laughs> manifestos are stuffed through full of promises to reform the Lords. We've had it all before. The Labour Party are the, the great reformers this time round. And I listen very carefully to the leader of the opposition set out his stall in this respect a few short weeks ago. Do it this time. Just do it. I mean, Labour had 13 years in power. And where they made some progress when they got rid of the hereditaries, more progress is, is required when it, when it comes to these issues. And I have to say to the Honourable Gentleman, Labour weren't particularly good in its relationship with the House of Lords. It was the Labour Party 
that looked over cash for honours. And the first thing that the Honourable Gentleman may think he might want to do if he's got concerns about the House of Lords, particularly its bloated nation, nature, stop putting people in it. Just stop it, because there is no need to put, make a bloated house even bigger. Now, the Conservatives have got different issues and attitudes about the House of Lords, and they probably will continue to put pe people in it. The Labour Party needs to stop stuffing that place full with any more cronies and donors. It's the first thing the Labour Party should do to demonstrate that it's serious this time about House of Lords reform. Mr Howarth, I hope that when we do get into the next Parliament, we are able at last to make some real progress in ending that farce. It is a circus. It is not fit for purpose. It is anachronistic. It's ridiculous. It's absurd and it's bizarre. We need something to ensure that it could do a proper job of scrutinising the activities of this House. Let's get rid of the whole shooting match. Let's start again. Let's put in place something that's fit for purpose and something that the whole nation could be proud of.